This is me eating bison ribs mm -mm 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 -mm. smothered in a spicy blueberry barbecue sauce. Sorry, uh, Whoa. Da, 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 da. And something mouthwateringly incredible called a posu bowl. And a fry bread taco. What do all these foods have in common? They're Native American cuisine, the cuisine of the indigenous people of this land, made with ingredients you could once only find here and nowhere else, made by people who were here before colonists like this guy and children of immigrants like me. Hi, my name's Yara, and if you've seen me before, you probably know that I take great enjoyment in eating things. Delicious lamb fat. Before I made this video, I would never eaten a legit Native American meal made by the Native community, which is strange because I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and it's pretty cosmopolitan here. I've eaten Burmese, Indian, Mexican, Russian, Korean, Japanese, Syrian, Peruvian, and Ethiopian food, but I'd never eaten at a Native restaurant. I'd never even seen one. There are supposedly some 600,000 restaurants in the US, but barely any of them, National Geographic says a handful, are Native American. When a lot of people think of Native cuisine, they think of Thanksgiving food or fry bread which are definitely a thing. But when I went on a road trip through the American Southwest with my co-producer Tabish, Santa Fe! I realized that it's so much more than that. Like, so, 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 so much more than that. So what is native cuisine today? What did it used to be? And why don't we see more of it on every street corner? So what's a Native American restaurant actually like? To show you, we're gonna start our story here, in Colorado. We have arrived in Denver. At like three in the morning, with very little sleep. We just drove for eight and a half hours. The redness of my eyes. So we are going to Tokabe, which is a Native American restaurant, and that's where we met Ben. We're very late. <laughs> He's a member of the Osage Nation. In 2008, he and his business partner, Matt, opened their first restaurant, and now they have two locations and a food truck. So they give us a behind the scenes look at what their food's like. We are in the kitchen. Oh my God, something is on fire. Wow. So we are setting what on fire? Cedar. We need to burn down a little bit more into ash. Okay. And then we're gonna mix it in that blue corn. We're gonna make blue corn mush. We'll get some water and we'll have to move to the stove. So this is the most <laughs> important part, watching it come to a boil. <laughs> I'm stirring the water. If this is not that exciting, we can do something else. Oh. This is way more exciting than watching water boil. We cook them in a bison stock that we make, so it really is the flavor of the animal. And we covered them in this incredible, like seriously incredible, spicy blueberry barbecue sauce. Ooh. That's our... I've never tasted anything like this in my life. It's our... Spicy, it's blueberry, it's yeah. barbecue-y. And then when you put it on the bison rib, the richness of the bison rib with yeah. the berry blends really, really well. We cut it right on the grill. Your knife just goes right down oh, and it just glides past. Nice. All right, oh my God, okay. So I grew up in a restaurant. Just go all the way through. Oh, man. Oh, no. <laughs> Your interview has come to an end. <laughs> then we put it all together. Oh, beautiful. So this is a wojapi, like a Northern Plains berry jam, you could say. That's beautiful, look at these colors, shall we? Dude, you're killing me. Is it good? <laughs> First with the sauce, now with this. Let's, let's try the ribs. <laughs> Man, the texture of the meat, that sauce. Okay, I'm just gonna take this. I was gonna say, I was about, I was about to have a bite. All together now. But there was more. Today we're gonna make our posu bowl. Okay. We're gonna do a base of the wild rice. Black beans or pinto beans, do you have a preference? Shredded bison. Yes. Hominy, it's a white puffy corn, cranberries, cilantro, red onions, yellow squash, zucchini, and jicama. Some green chilies. Elderberry vinaigrette. Let's show the camera. The idea for Tokabe came up when Ben and Matt had this question. Like, why is native cuisine not present outside of our community? So, you know, you can get it at home, you can get it at powwows, you can get it at community gatherings, but why is it not available on a daily basis? So, they made it available on a daily basis. And today, Tokabe is one of the only Native American restaurant chains in America. I mean, I wish we could have shown you how they make their fry bread taco with bison, or their pozole soup with plump hominy, or their sweet fry bread nuggets, and their slightly charred soft bread called bannock. So, so good.
Native cuisine has been around for thousands of years, but the food we had at Tokabe, that's something totally new. Native food professionals are taking ancestral ingredients and combining and preparing them in new ways around the country. You know, we're the oldest cultures on this land, but in many ways we have the youngest cuisine. And the reason for that is it's not clearly defined outside of like our communities. But how did this new Native American cuisine come about? And what exactly makes it, well, Native American? For that, I've got to rewind and tell you how we ended up here. Our journey actually started in New Mexico. Welcome to Albuquerque. This airport is so festive. We're here to cook with a master of Southwest Native American cuisine, who's a chef slash photographer slash PhD. Dang! We are on our way to Santa Fe tonight. There are chilies next to our hotel room. What? We are here to interview Lois Ellen Frank. Hey! Lois is part of the Kiowa Nation on her mom's side and Sephardic Jewish on her dad's side. She owns a catering company specializing in native cuisine, and she runs it with Chef Walter Whitewater, who's from the Navajo Nation. <laughs> Together, they host exclusive dinners showcasing a unique take on ancient recipes. Recipes Lois included in her award-winning cookbook. Native American cuisine has evolved over 10,000 years. And it's super diverse. There are over 570 federally recognized tribes in the U.S., each hailing from different regions. Tribes in the Great Plains might have eaten bison and choke cherries. In the East, they consumed wild turkeys, turtles, and other small game. And those in the Pacific Northwest had access to multiple types of salmon and wild onions. But despite that diversity, Lois has categorized thousands of years of Native American cuisine into four distinct historical periods. The first is the pre-contact period, which is... All the foods that existed before contact with any other culture group outside of Native people. That includes all the food Natives hunted, gathered, grew, and traded on their own before the European invasion. And that would be the basis, the foundation for Native American cuisine. So, wild game. And... What I call the magic eight. So corn, beans, squash, chili, tomato, potato, vanilla, and cacao. Inherently American. Does that mean that corn didn't exist outside of the Americas in 1491? Yes. Beans, squash, didn't exist outside of the Americas. The Italians didn't have the tomato. The Irish didn't have the potato. The Russians, they didn't have vodka or right. potato. Half the British national dish, fish and chips, did not exist. No chilies in any Asian cuisine, in any East Indian cuisine. And the French had no confection using vanilla or chocolate. So many dishes that are familiar to you and me, chicken tikka masala, spaghetti and meatballs, Thai green curry, wouldn't exist as you know them without Native American ingredients. Which brings us to the next period. So we have cuisine that's old, diverse, sophisticated, delicious, and then we have this contact. With the Europeans. All right, let's just focus on the Spanish influence. And we can say, well, they brought horses, guns, disease, and rats. Okay, but we don't eat those. <laughs> they brought domesticated animals, sheep, pork, beef, chickens, and the byproducts of those animals. If you think about Native Americans, most of us are lactose intolerant. We ate wild game. Do you think you could get close enough to an elk to milk it? After a few centuries of this food exchange, Native ingredients spread throughout the world. But as that happened, Native Americans were being robbed of their land. Millions and millions of immigrants were coming to the United States. And maybe that's a good thing for the immigrants, mm -hmm. but not such a good thing for Native people. These new settlers really, really wanted land. And they pillaged, plundered, and killed Natives and burned down their towns to get their hands on it. The U.S. government played a massive role too. They even passed something called the Indian Removal Act. And one of the biggest atrocities they committed came to be known as the Trail of Tears. Starting in the 1830s, tens of thousands of natives in the Southeast were forced to march thousands of miles in harsh conditions. Thousands upon thousands died. Those that survived were confined to a designated Indian territory, right around here. And over the next few decades, even more tribes were crammed into the space. My tribe is evicted and moved to Indian territory. And the land the US government confined them to Little by little, even that was seized by the settlers. Other tribes were being forced onto plots of land called reservations as a way to control them. Once there, they couldn't hunt, gather, or grow traditional foods like they used to. This is when a lot of native cuisine was lost. 
Whenever you're displaced, you lose traditional knowledge surrounding where you've been living for thousands of years. What foods grow, what animals are there, when to plant, when to harvest. Now, native people were living on unfamiliar land, forced to live without the resources they used to have. So the government steps in and issues commodity foods, starvation foods, army rations, to keep them alive, barely. We call this the government issue the government issued foods for survival. These were ingredients like flour, lard, coffee, and sugar. Foods that were completely different from what natives were used to, with far less nutritional value than their own traditional cuisine. Out of this period, fry bread's born. And so fry bread is an interesting native food, an imposed government food that we use for survival. Those elders, if they didn't come up with this bread, maybe they would have perished. But it also represents colonization. That history is why some native chefs use fry bread and others don't. And that brings us to the last period, the one we're in now. It's what Lois calls new Native American cuisine. Now, native chefs around the United States are classically trained, equal to their European counterparts, and we are choosing what ingredients from what period we want to put in our menus. I can construct menus from any of those periods, all of those periods, and the way we present them are very new. So we help them prep for one of their big events. What are we making today? Roasted chilies. From stuffing the bison inside of it. Ooh. And it's a starch. Because that holds together. I use quinoa. <laughs> the native people always tell you, like, don't cook it when you're angry, you know, or you'll make the food bitter. Native people a long time ago devised this method of charring chilies because when you char a chili, you bring the oil out. So the oil is the medicine and the oil is the flavor. I'm just filling my little yeah, my little boat go. with yeah. <laughs> with goodies. One, two, three. Right. What are we making? Stuffed trout. So this is sage from the garden. Oh. This is probably the first ancestral oven. We're gonna roll it in corn husk, which I call the Native American aluminum foil. And you're mummifying this. <laughs> And then we're going to wrap it in clay. Okay. Once it's in clay... Oh no, you ripped it. It would have been put into the fire, but the clay protects it, steaming it. Beautiful. Beautiful. And then the guests arrived, and Lois gave them an important history refresher. It's always about who's telling the story. So if Native people got on boats and went to Europe, Europe would be the new world. And then we ate. Yeah, how's the food? I think Derek has a good reaction. How was it? It was amazing. There was so much complexity and depth to all the flavors. Everything that was on this table tonight blew my mind. Oh, and I almost forgot. Does anyone want to experience the cracking? Isn't that amazing? And really what we've done is we've created an ancient oven. It smells amazing. It does smell amazing. I think I made that one. <laughs> so in shaping. some instances, you're going to have to be a little more aggressive. <laughs> so you can actually see the herbs right inside. Corn is a pretty amazing plant. We can use the husk, we can use the cobs, and we can use the kernels. It's a very native way of thinking is zero waste. What's the sauce? This is a guajillo chili. Look how beautiful. It's moist, it's steamed. I didn't just want to attend an event, eat the food, and move on. I, I wanted to know more about the people behind that food and their history. So Walter was kind enough to invite us to the Navajo Nation, where he grew up. So we packed our bags and said goodbye to the hotel. After a long drive, we ended up in a place called Canyon de Chez. It's all here. It's all right there, the voice. Oh, that is phenomenally beautiful. Wow. Canyon de Chez is a sacred site for the Navajo, especially because of the towering spider rock. Legend has it, the rock was home to Spider Woman, who taught the Navajo the art of weaving. But the canyon's walls are also etched with a tragic story of hurt and pain. This land and your connection to it. What happened here 150 years ago? People took the, the long walk. In the 1860s, 
thousands of Navajos and some Apaches were violently removed from their lands. They were forced to march to what was essentially a concentration camp in southeastern New Mexico. I believe they called it the New Mexico Trail of Tears. Everything was taken away from us. Hundreds of Navajo died during the long walk. They were starved and raped and shot if they couldn't keep up. That included pregnant women and the elderly. And the story at Canyon de Chez, a Navajo stronghold, was particularly horrifying. The American military carried out a scorched earth campaign. They slaughtered the Navajo's sheep, burned their crops, and starved them until they surrendered. When they seen their crops, their animals being destroyed, taking that long walk without food and water, when that happened, when everything is taken away from you, it shatters everyone, you know? The Navajo eventually arrived at the camp, but the land wasn't fit for farming and hunting was difficult there. They had no choice but to abandon their ancestral foods and survive off of nutritionally poor U.S. military food rations. As a result, over 2,000 of them died of disease and starvation. Eventually, the U.S. government released those that survived. But like other tribes, they were then confined to a reservation, which has today become the Navajo Nation. These forced removals of native people were guided by a racist ideology known as Manifest Destiny, that somehow this land belonged to white settlers and only white settlers through some sort of divine order. Even to this day, some of the, the, the old people talked about what happened and how are we are gonna carry on our traditional ways that we used to have. So much of native culture was passed down by word of mouth, but being robbed of their land, their way of life, being killed and forced onto reservations, that led to the loss of a lot of cultural traditions, including culinary ones. The repercussions of that brutal colonial past are apparent as soon as you drive onto the reservation. Not only is there a severe lack of native restaurants here, there's, well, a severe lack of everything food related. The Navajo Nation is a food desert. There are only about 10 grocery stores in the entire area of nearly 28,000 square miles. And 80% of the foods in those stores have little to no nutritional value. Driving around the reservation, it's hard to find much else besides fast food. Native people's traditional diets have been decimated by years of colonization, and this has led to extremely high rates of obesity and diabetes. Today, Native Americans are twice as likely to get diabetes as someone who's white. And that's why, for Walter, helping others from his community reconnect with their culinary traditions is so important. If you don't pass it, it's gonna go away. They always tell us, hang on to your root, hang on to what you have. Little that I can, I always pass it down to whoever that wants to learn, you know. And you're keeping it alive oh, yourself. Yeah. Oh yeah. Before we left the Navajo Nation, Walter taught me how to cook this incredible dish of lamb chops in a chili honey glaze. I love the color on that. Huh? So we got some chili powder. Yeah. And then we're gonna get some honey. Ooh, that's really good. Look at that. Pine nuts are also very much mm -hmm. Navajo. Oh, yeah. And the food was so tasty, especially this delicious piece of lamb fat. After cleaning up, high fiving Walter, Thanks so much. and feeding bones to some stray dogs, no, it's there. We were on our way to our final destination, the place where this video started. The drive there was very pretty and exhilarating. And we zoom into the cows, dude. So many cows. And if you remember, I was pretty delirious by the time we arrived. Oh my god, it is late. So we're back at Tokabe with Ben and Matt, where we ate this, 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 and this. But let's go back to that initial question that inspired this whole trip. So in a lot of big cities across the country, we have Chinese restaurants, we have Italian restaurants, we have Mexican restaurants, but we don't have a Native American restaurant like on every street corner. Why is that? I think for so long, the food was very much held within the community. Mom's cooking, grandma's cooking, dad's cooking. We didn't have a lot of other restaurants to really look towards to like design ourselves off of, to build off of. And remember, that has a lot to do with the centuries of ruthless colonization that devastated Native food culture. The forced removals, the killings, the rupturing of ancestral traditions that date back thousands of years. 
So now we're at this place where they're native chefs. I mean, like really successful, highly skilled native chefs. And we can really create what we want the food to be. And we can create it in a restaurant environment that not only tells the story of the food, but tells the story of the people. and really has like the heart of it. Because what we do at the end of the day is we represent people. And that really needs a part of what the food is. Chefs like Lois, Ben, Walter, and others are bringing about a revival of Native American cuisine and restoring it to its rightful place. And while the new native restaurant scene is still emerging, native food is already, in a sense, everywhere. It's in your pasta, it's in your curry, and it's in your dessert. Everyone's cuisine owes something to Native Americans. And who knows, maybe someday soon, we'll have Native American restaurants run by native people telling their own stories on every street corner in every major city across this country. Because seriously, you need to try this incredible spicy blueberry barbecue sauce on these incredible bison ribs. Hey, I have a beard. Anyway, you guys, native cuisine is really, really good. If you haven't tried it just like I had it, try to find a Native American restaurant near where you live. Drive there, commute there, run there. Try to find a way to get there because it may very well blow your mind. And hey, if you want more videos like this, make sure to click that red subscribe button below.